Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to sit if that's all right. I've got a long term illness, so I'm going to sit um, because we're inclusive here and that's nice. Um, so I'm Kat Hopwood Lewis. I'm the Senior Historic Environment Advisor for Peatlands at Natural England. As implied by the name, obviously, we cover England as our remit, but I do also sit on the UK uh, Working Party for Cultural Heritage in Peatlands, which is across the entire devolved nation. So hopefully what I say is relevant to colleagues from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland as well, um, even though the consenting regimes and such may be slightly different there. Um, and I guess, why does Natural England have anything to do with WSIs or archaeology, in fact? So we are the statutory body for conserving and enhancing landscape. And from our perspective, that also includes monuments, buildings and subsurface features which contribute to the landscape. And that's in the NERC Act, the Natural Environment Act, which is our founding piece of legislation. We're also a massive massive funder via agri-environment but also of research also via my own grant scheme the peatland grant scheme and tangentially via other um what we call nature-based solutions um to things like climate change and flooding which have historic environment elements within them so there are about uh, 12 expert archaeologists at Natural England and there's also a cohort of land management advisors who take an interest in the historic environment and work at a more local level with guidance from us. Um, we're also a landowner so uh, we manage two-thirds of the 225 uh, national nature reserves that are in the country so we look at WSIs from that perspective as somebody who is commissioning work and at the moment we have an initiative to remove all heritage at risk from our nature reserves. So uh, my colleague Steve Hall is in charge of that, a pot of money, and is busily commissioning work off people. Um, and finally, and the way in which I have been asked to speak today is as a provider of historic environment advice. Now, if you look in the standard and guidance for archaeological advice, it's the usual suspects, you know, it's um, members of our Geo Historic England uh, charitable trusts, but we're in there under uh, other non-for-profit public bodies. That's who we are. And also my other archaeological colleagues in DEFRA group. So people from Forestry England or Forestry Commission and uh, Environment Agency would also be considered archaeological advisors. So you're probably all familiar with what the uh, archaeology uh, WSI provisions are in kind of excavation and evaluation, but what does it say for advisors about WSIs? Um, the suitability of the specification should be judged by the advisor on its ability to produce, and this is a deliberate skip, the required archaeological outcomes and will provide a benchmark against which the results of the work may be measured. So that's how I approach WSIs, that's what I'm looking for. And I've deliberately skipped the word planning because planning uh, quite often doesn't figure in my work at all. So uh, the grant scheme that I work on has its own provisions which are within the spirit of NPCS, but don't necessarily fall within that. The size of the individual sites is sometimes too low to uh, trigger environmental impact assessment. Although there is a consultation out about the replacements at environmental impact assessment at the moment, April 2023. Uh, so please do respond to that on the environmental outcome reports because it's really important. Um, maybe more of my work would fall under planning if you were all to respond uh, positively to that consultation. So um, what do Natural England staff do? So we write briefs, not WSIs, and there is a brief uh, provided to the workshop later. Um, and we also provide model briefs, the experts provide model briefs that are used by our regions and some of our individual uh, nature reserves. And those briefs are responded to with WSIs and we read those responses. And um, so personally, I was trying to estimate how many WSIs I've read and it must be in thousands by now. You know, I've been working at Natural England since 2013. I was a field archaeologist and wrote WSIs before then. Uh, which is why I've been nominated for today's last minute substitution. Um, and uh, we also assess the WSIs that come in. And although we do very minimal excavation, I would say, we pretty much run the gap of everything else, all the other kinds of things. And particularly, we do a lot of survey work. 
um, or fund a lot of survey work. Um, we fund grant-aided projects via agri-environment, so you sometimes may not be aware until you read the brief that Natural England are the funder. You may have been approached by a landowner or a farmer, um, and then you'll see in the background that it's actually via agri-environment that you're being paid. Um, and they will ask us before they sign off that piece of work and give you your money whether we think it's okay and we will measure that against your WSI so you really need to be certain that you are happy with what you've got in that WSI because there's a benchmark for payment. Um, WSIs are also used as evidence for permissions so uh, while Natural England advise on agri-environment the Royal Payment Agency currently run that scheme and they ask us so um, if you have a farmer, for example, who is being paid to protect species with grassland and you want to do an archaeological dig on that grassland, you should be getting permission from RPA to have those trenches on there. Otherwise, that farmer is liable to get a fine. And what do they do with that WSI? They're not technical experts. They're um, focused very heavily on payment and enforcement. So they send it to us and we read it and we make a recommendation over whether that is OK or not and whether it should go forward. So and that is very much the case for whether it's a research dig, whether it's a commercial dig um, or any sort of work. Um, and that would include things like survey where there's a risk of bird disturbance. Um, and finally, obviously, we are a consenting body. We're not a consenting body for the historic environment. Uh, that is historic England and England and the various other bodies across the devolved nations. Um, but we do do SSI, FAC and European site consents. And so I'll talk a little bit about how your WSI should be precise and specific because habitats regulations is a very um, prescriptive process it will either pop out with a yes or a no based on the supporting evidence that you've provided. So we really need that evidence. Um, what Natural England have started to do is something called the Discretionary Advice Service. So in the past, if you submitted a request via a landowner for triple SI consent, we might tell you where you've gone wrong. However, it is a new and exciting world of commercial uh, ventures for the public sector. And now we charge you for that advice. So take these tips on board, everybody. Um, so Matt has already mentioned the Syria document that was also talked about in the intro to this session. Um, that's within planning. It's the main archaeological control and quality assurance document. Now, I've said WSI here, but we use the term project design. We use that because it's got more in common with natural environment parlance. Um, but WSI or project design describes a project, in our opinion, that's eligible for grant aid or payment. So that's really important. If we look at that WSI and we can't pay for those outcomes, then there's a problem with the WSI. It needs to be able to be consented, so it needs to have enough information within it that it can be consented, whether that's an agri-environment permission or a triple SI consent. It needs to fulfil industry standard best practice, so all the things that Matt said. I could come up here and go, what Matt said, and that would pretty much cover it. Um, but all those Southport um, reports as well, we do look for those. Um, even though we're a funder, we are also subscribe to uh, professional standards, and so we are looking for things like public engagement as well. Um, and it needs to be implementable. So as a landowner, when we're looking at a WSI, we need to know that that's actually going to work on the ground. And I think that's really important. I'll come back to that in a bit. So the title of this session is Improving Quality and Scope. And I've put the old ELD project management triangle on here because that's only two bits, isn't it? That's, that's a bit of a cheaty title because actually we all know that there's time and cost involved in creating a WSI and getting that work. And that brings us around to templates, doesn't it? So we all use templates. We use templates in Natural England. Contractors use templates. Uh, we know it, it's a thing, but how can we use them properly? How can we not create those mistakes that Matt was talking about, about citing something that's out of date, citing the wrong standards and guidance for what you're actually doing? Um, so you need to use these templates and FIFA very specifically flags that to you in the excavation guidance, and I think it's flagged in all the other ones as well, actually. And it's nodding at me, so that's good. Um, so 
rather than tell you what goes wrong, I thought I'd flip it and talk about what you can do. What you can do. So um, tell me, you are a competent person. This seems like the most simple thing in the world, but I will tell you the number of people, and it's particularly sole traders who do this, who so strongly identify with their company, that they tell me the author of a report is XYZ archaeology. But it's not an RO. And you haven't told me who you are and what your qualifications are, so I cannot look you up on the CIFA register. Everybody here has got a shortcut to pr proving that they're competent because they've been through validations. So if you just write your name and I can see that you're a competent person, you can even shortcut it by giving me your postnomials. Please do that. It's great. Um, if you are not a CIFA person, I have to go to great lengths to establish who you are and whether or not you're a competent person before I can even look at your work. So it's well worth the, the fee. It really is. You can claim it back on tax. Do it. It's brilliant. And also don't be cheap about your employees if you're a big organisation. So I do look at the grades of who's doing the work as well as who rubber stamped the report. So if you are MC for, I will hold you responsible if you have rubber stamped that report, even if you delegated it to your most lowliest employee who haven't bothered to get accreditation. So be nice. Um, it needs to be relevant best practice and you need to update regularly. So uh, when Historic England and the English Heritage Trust first divided, the amount of stuff that I got quoting English Heritage was quite extraordinary and for quite an extraordinary length of time, as in three years after the split. Uh, I think when the standards and guidance for evaluation updated, but that was originally 2014. I think people are still quote in 2014 for about five years. I do notice. And Matt said something about being picky. I wouldn't say picky, but I would say detail orientated. Because what that is, is that it's a red flag to me that you're using a template improperly. And I'm going to look more forensically at your work because that's my job to do that, to check that you're not just churning something out, that you actually mean what you say. So don't make those mistakes. Because I will immediately, I'm on high alert then. Oh, somebody's been a bit dodgy here. What are they up to? Um, respond to the site, respond to the brief. So um, Jen talked about how uh, a standard sets the outcome. The brief sets the outcome. It's the outcome orientated. What do we want to see? What we need from you is how you are going to achieve that. So break it down. Um, I remember a case where I had asked for a topographic survey on a site. And it was 50% grassland, 50% woodland, um, and there were badgers. And so in the brief, I very specifically said, you cannot go into this woodland in the autumn and winter because that is a badger. Like, that's England's very concerned about this sort of thing. Obviously, that's our bag. Um, and I got five quotes and four came back saying they were going to use GPS survey in the summer in broadleaf woodland. I went, no, you're not. You haven't got that job. The person who said they were going to do GPS on the grassland and topo survey using a total station in the woodland got that work. And they could have quoted any amount of money for that because they were only compliant bid. So think about the site. Respond to the site. Um, be specific. So I have something the other day. Somebody wanted my consent for sampling for a research project. Somebody asked me some asking advice they'd sent me i'm going to do this sample of this amount of sample is it a protected it's a protected site what do i need to know and i really thought about it because yes you've told me the volume of samples but you haven't told me the frequency of them you haven't told me the total area that you're working within you haven't told me the timing of this naturally i'm really concerned about timing because when you're working with protected species those time windows are really important. And everyone who works in a multidisciplinary consult, you know, environment, if you're sitting with your natural environment colleagues or you're in a big consultancy, go and ask them. You know, there are timetables of which species are breathing when that you can print out and have on your wall. I've got one. Um, you know, so be really specific. Access routes are really important. So to get through habitats regulations. You need to prove that you are doing the minimum amount of damage to the site. And so that means shortest route, unless there's a specific reason why it can't be shortest route. And you 
you to show that you've considered those and if it can't be for some reason there's a reason why you're going across the protected land from the route so all that kind of thing the more specific you are the more likely you are to get that kind of thing um on the research questions front absolutely um but i do think sometimes people get a bit ambitious with what they may or may not think they're going to uh, link to from one small intervention. Um, however, there is going to be a new way of linking to research framework, Spire Oasis. I don't know the details yet, but I understand that when you deposit your report, you'll be able to link through to the actual research goals in your regional research framework. So that's going to be really interesting um, and hopefully it will encourage people to, to think about that more clearly. Um, on research, think about synergies. So you're doing one intervention now, but are you doing lots of different projects on a similar thing? Or are you one part of a whole? So we had a lot of archaeologists working on individual parklands during the Capability Brown centenary. They actually all came together to pool their work, which went into a publication for that centenary. Each one was only doing you know, maybe a small bit of survey, but together, that is actually a massive update of our knowledge about Capability Brown Parklands. So think about research synthesis, um, public benefits. Matt's gone about public benefits to the kind of traditional audience, but uh, the funder wants to know what the benefits are to them. So develop control, what's the benefits to your house developer, what is your benefits to your person who's creating infrastructure for Natural England? What are our benefits? What does our organisation care about? You can find that out on our websites on, on .gov.uk and you'll find that we're really into green social prescribing. We're really into getting people outdoors into the natural environment. So the way you phrase that public benefits question might change depending on who the funder is and also i see a lot of proposals for open days um in the natural environment you're right there is no excuse to not do that but you might want to think about the timing whoever at cba decided that national archaeology week be in july want to be shocked because uh, it should be in either easter or in the october summer holidays when i don't have to decline lots of questions go on land with bird breeding so you know think about that it's, it doesn't have to be on site it can be somewhere else and if you're working in a rural environment and that is a really remote site it's not going to be accessible to a wide range of people there will be financial barrier to getting there is there somewhere close by is there a center of population where the public engagement would be better suited is digital engagement better suited and I think when you're thinking about how you're going to disseminate your results, you absolutely should be, if you can, do more than just a grey lit report. Um, but be a bit creative about it and be realistic. You're not going to write a massive multi-page uh, monograph on a small watching brief on a peak in, in Cumbria. It's not going to happen. But maybe, again, you're looking at synergies, you're looking at creating a synthesis of all the work that you've done within those multiple pro related projects. You know, perhaps you are doing something online, perhaps you are working with artists. We've seen a lot of um, great art and archeology span consultations recently. Um, University of Glasgow did an amazing one called uh, Bright Art Deep, which was about uh, the archeology span Pete and engaging people with it in an emotional way and changing perspectives and I think particularly um, in my own work on peatlands we're talking about changing attitudes to climate change we're talking about changing attitudes to has this land really always been like this or is it part of a dynamic landscape that changes over time and therefore changes to management now may actually be beneficial and be sort of best and so that public engagement and those research dissemination can change attitudes it's not just a box ticking um, use appropriate specialists I've got a lovely story about this uh, I was rejected 
a, a massive £60,000 to the side that was submitted to do a uh, parkland plan because somebody thought that their wife could have a go at the uh, landscape history section and when I plumbed into what her qualifications were she had a B at GCSE history and I said no right like genuinely you can get to the point where somebody scored so closely that the qualifications of your specialist are the difference between you getting work and not so really and I think what impresses me in the WSI last point, what I love you telling me something that I don't already know. I love you telling me about a new method that will do it quicker, cheaper and better, obviously, because I'm a funder. I love uh, you looking at the site and realising I've missed something because it shows me you've responded to the site. We're not trying to be tricksy. We will in all confidence tell you everything that we do know about the site, sometimes in great and enormous detail, as you'll see from the brief that I've circulated. But, um, you know, if you can tell me something that I don't know, then you're proving that you are a competent person. And that's really what I want to say.